For the first time, cutting-edge computer graphics transform the scans into remarkable images of the seabed. This is Alcatraz, as never seen before. Today, the island is a museum run by the National Park Service. Over a million visit every year. One man has watched it rise to become one of America's most visited attractions. Ranger John Cantwell. He's worked on the island for over 25 years. He knows its history. There's a term that we use on Alcatraz, layers of history. And the first layer of history would be the Army's time on Alcatraz. They arrived in 1853 and built a fortress to protect the harbor. The Federal Bureau of Prisons take over in 1934, and they ran the island for 29 years as a supermax penitentiary. American justice reserved Alcatraz for the worst of the worst. The prison was fortified to make sure they would stay put. Where I'm standing is on Broadway. This is the main corridor in the cell house. Alcatraz being a supermax penitentiary meant that you had high security, one officer for every three convicts. They were constantly being watched. 12 times a day, they would have counted every convict in this penitentiary building. Prison breaks were suppressed with extreme force. But escape was a constant temptation. Freedom was just a short swim away. The punishment of Alcatraz was this, the view of what was going on across the bay. Everything's in plain view, and these men that were incarcerated on Alcatraz could see it. I think it's fair to say every guy that ever did time here considered, how are you going to escape? Liberty seemed so close that for some, it was irresistible. The official count is uh, 14 different escape attempts. Of that number, uh, five men are still unaccounted for. To make it off the island, the convicts first had to escape from the prison itself. Well, probably one of the most famous escape attempts from the building is the 1937 Rowe and Cole escape attempt. They cut through the windows and pop out into the San Francisco Bay. And they sent boats out looking for those uh, two guys and never found them. The official on this is, is that they were swept out to sea. Powerful currents weren't the only dangers facing escapees. Alcatraz folklore claimed that predatory sharks swam in the Bay Area. In 1959, a college student had been killed by a great white in these waters. And in 2015, the Alcatraz shark legend was confirmed on camera when tourists witnessed a great white attacking a seal at the island's dock. But fear of shark attacks didn't stop the escape attempts. And these were becoming easier as the fabric of Alcatraz began to crumble. The complex was aging. Concrete starts to crack and spall, steel rusts, uh, barbed wire rusts. It's almost impossible to make an escape-proof prison. In the last year before the prison closed, there were two remarkable escape attempts. In December 1962, two men made it to the water. John Paul Scott and Daryl Parker escaped from the basement of the penitentiary building. And they cut through two bars of the basement uh, window, pop out the window, shimmy up a set of pipes, scramble across the rooftop of the cell house, and basically came down off the west wall of Alcatraz Island, scrambled down this road, and hit the water. They found Daryl Parker standing on that rock on Little Alcatraz Island about 50 yards off the north end, waving to the officer in the guard tower, yelling, come get me. But they found John Paul Scott at the base of the Golden Gate Bridge. John Paul Scott was officially the only prisoner to successfully swim across the bay. But he was so exhausted when they found him that he was quickly returned to Alcatraz. There was one other escape attempt in 1962, the most famous in the prison's history. Three convicts, Frank Morris, and brothers Clarence and John Anglin, planned for months to escape, and eventually got off the island on a homemade raft. But they were never seen again. Case is still alive. The official record is they're presumed drowned. 
It's one of the great Alcatraz mysteries. Could Morris and the Anglin brothers have been the only ones to make it to freedom? Alcatraz closed in the spring of 1963. Officially, no one escaped successfully. But its true strength as a prison can't be explained just by the thickness of its walls or the vigilance of its guards. The waters around the rock were also a deadly barrier to escape. Now science can explain just how and why the bay was so dangerous. Imagine if you could pull the plug on the bottom of the bay and drain the water from around Alcatraz. For the first time, we can combine high-definition sonar scans and cutting-edge computer images to show the hidden world of the seabed and this remarkable landscape. Finally, we have an unobstructed view of Alcatraz. It's a rock that rises from San Francisco Bay. It's isolated, but it's highly visible from the shore. You can also you can reach out and touch it, but it's a mile and a half away. Draining the bay reveals Alcatraz as a pinnacle of bedrock emerging from the sea floor. It's surrounded by mountain peaks. All of them are ancient survivors from an age of earthquakes. Tom Parsons is a geophysicist with the United States Geological Survey. He has studied this area for decades. So we're standing at the Golden Gate and we're standing on mountains that were formed 100 million years ago. And we're sandwiched right between the San Andreas and the parallel Hayward Fault, both of which are helping to accommodate plate motion here between the Pacific and North American plates. San Francisco sits right on the edge of the North American plate. As the Pacific plate grinds north past it, stress builds up along the major fault lines in the area. The Hayward Fault, and most notably, the San Andreas. Uh, this region is very volatile. It, it produces large earthquakes. We've seen them in 1906, 1868. Both were devastating earthquakes in San Francisco. The nightmarish effects of the 1906 earthquake, 7.9 on the Richter scale, are a reminder of how the area's violent geology can threaten the existence of a great city. 